Welcome to Real PropTech, the conference about the transformation of the real estate industry. So, now everything is ready. I'd like to welcome on stage Daria. <laughs> you can leave your purse over there. No one is going to take it away. Only honest people here. Ani and Mark, please uh, come on stage. A big round of applause for our VC guests. This is what I love about this location. It's always a question, who sits where? Uh, it was no doubt that Daria is going to be in the middle. Um, great. It's a great perk. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Diversity in, uh, in PropTech. So, uh, at the end of the day, we are talking about money. Uh, but before we do, I'd like you to introduce yourself, um, and I'd like you to touch on three questions. Since when do you invest? What phase do you focus on? And how many investments have you done? So I look at you, Arnie, if you can kick it off. Sure, uh, Arnie here from Roundhill Ventures. Uh, we've been investing in PropTech since late 2016. To date, we've made 15 direct investments and two small accelerator investments. Uh, in terms of stages, we invest across late seed to series B, and we invest across Europe, but predominantly it's been London and Berlin centric, which kind of reflects the PropTech market to date. So, for, did I get it right? Focus London and UK? Or uh, it, or it's pan European it? focus, <coughs> but the portfolio to date has been very London and Berlin focused. Let's see how that evolves over time. Yeah. Daria, <laughs> what's your strategy? Hi, I'm Daria. I'm a partner of Vito One. We are located in Munich. Um, we started investing in PropTech in 2015. Um, so far, we have invested in 20 companies. We have exited one uh, last year, Home Day. Um, the stage is um, very early seed, uh, also late seed, some, somewhere you know, where you already have, ideally you have the product and you already have some feedback from the market, um, which we can validate and talk to your customers, we love that. And in terms of regions, we invest in, in Europe, probably <coughs> similar to you. So we have probably 50% of our investments are, are located in German speaking countries, but we do um, spread across Europe. Mark. Yeah, I'm investing since 2015 after I finished my work for the mother of all prop techs, Immobilien Scout, and um, have done as a business angel in the prop tech sector 13 investments. And I'm also working as a venture partner for Bitstone Capital, which is a VC uh, Cologne based um, focused on the prop tech sector. We've invested now our first fund um, uh, fully with uh, 15 investments and are about to complete our second one, mostly Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and uh, combining always capital with the competence of our industrial LPs. So all of these investments are in the prop tech sphere. Um, I look at you, Daria. What was your expect, uh, expectations for the real estate industry and the, the uptake for technology? And have these expectations been met um, in your investments when you look at your portfolio? I think we were pretty uh, realistic in the beginning when we started. We, um, we have two sister funds, Vito Ventures and Vito One. When we started, we kind of we, we did a lot of technology-driven investment across all industries and then realized the huge amount of potential in the prop tech along the whole value chain of a building in real estate, also given now an industrial um, Lehman Partners um, network. And I think we knew that it's going to take long. And I think also coming from the technology side, of, um, side we also knew that it's going to take long on the product side and then the scalability and then at some point the market adoption will come. So I think it's taking long. <laughs> Uh, Ani, what's your, I, I look at you right away, um, coming from the UK, who is a little bit ahead of us in, when in, terms, uh, in terms of prop tech investments, at least that's what you tell us. What's, what's your take on it? Is, it? is your expectation that the investment that you do as a VC for prop tech are going to take longer than in other verticals? So over the 15 companies, we've had a kind of mixed results in terms of take up. Um, there have been certainly, a group, I won't go to specifics, but groups of our companies which have been adopted relatively easily within the, within the industry. And I think the companies that are getting adopted are the ones that are adding something different to the current way of business. So it's, maybe it's an additional revenue line 
or it's a particular problem set that industry faces, rather than companies that are changing the fundamentals of how that value chain is uh, currently kind of in play. Um, and so we forgot, you know, we're still learning as well. So I think the guys who are doing the kind of lighter touch companies, they're getting adopted much, uh, much more easily and kind of scaling. And then we've got companies who are trying to change the way the industry actually operates and how the decision makers actually think. Those companies are struggling to grow as quickly as a, a traditional VC would hope. But I think that's just reflecting in the nature of our industry. Um, but what we have noticed is even the sales cycle within those tougher businesses are shortening over time. And uh, we're certainly seeing it being a bit more receptive today than it was back in 2016. Okay, Mark, if I, look, if, if I listen closely, it sounds a little bit like that uh, PropTech is not really something for VCs. What's your take? What's your experience? Yeah, I can share with Ani that uh, the first wave of uh, PropTechs are mostly B2C related. If I look at the three last big rounds, um, Expo, uh, MacMakler, Famitid.de are a bit B2C related, but lack this physical aspect, which the kind of current wave of smart building IoT related uh, ventures are about, which certainly take longer. So I think um, you as a PropTech VC investing in this kind of B2B and third wave, um, you need to be good at timing, timing when to invest and also about the horizon. If you have the traditional, like let's say Anglo-Saxon VC view, where you need to double or uh, you need to uh, 5x, 10x in a few years, that will be difficult. Um, so you need to be a bit more patient and also be ready to build companies. And that's what we try to, to do. It's easy to say this as a business angel because it, the, the spending or the investment is, your, is at your pure discretion or sole discretion. But uh, how does it work in play with your LPs? Do they understand that PropTech is special, that the real estate industry might be a little bit uh, more tricky, especially in the B2B models? In our case, yes. It's about expectation management, and our LPs are also from the real estate industry. They understand that uh, construction times take their time. Um, there are cycles, uh, if you do retrofit, that it's not done overnight, and you ju can't just tune on Facebook or Google. So they understand that, and they invest with a longer time horizon also, because they look at these investments not only as good financial investments, but as something to transform their own businesses. And I think, if I can add to that, I think if you have professional LP base, uh, and if you have LPs who've been in the market for a longer time, been investing in VC as an asset class, um, that they know that if you look at the last 20 years, then the, like, the average lifetime of a fund in digital, and also rather technology-driven fund, was about 14 years, right? So if you invest in, in today, we're not only, and I think I agree with you, it depends if you look at the portfolio, if it's a B2C business model innovation, or if it's a deep tech enabled B2B play in the construction. So the scalability speed is going to be different, but you have to be smart about that and you, you have to kind of anticipate that and it's about expectations management, yeah. Ani, is there anything that you want to add from your experience? Yeah, just to touch upon the, uh, the LP comment there, I think. We too also obviously have um, LPs who have huge exposure to real estate. I think it's also educating the LPs in terms of what the expectations are within our industry. Um, if you're having LPs who think you're, you're the next kind of SaaS VC fund and expect margins of 90% scaling in a 100% plus year on year, then I think you have a misalignment between the LPs' expectations and what's potentially what you can deliver potentially as well within, within your fund. So I think there's an education piece both to the LPs and then how you structure your own fund to optimize for success. Um, so if you're going in there and actually being smart about the way you're structuring your fund and then also working with your LPs, then I think PropTech has plenty of opportunities that you can be investing in. The good thing is that also I think real estate professionals often think in projects uh, and not in kind of platforms or scalable business models, so recurring revenue as a currency is something which they're not familiar with, so we also can take them along that journey, the same where we take the IoT um, companies, for example, starting as a project with pilot projects, then have a product which can scale, and then we will become more mature, so I think that's a common journey. 
I find it interesting that you say on one side it's sometimes more company building on the part of the uh, prop techs, but it's also uh, educational part on, of the LPs because what I, what I take from this is that they are not only expecting return in terms of financial return, but also return in terms of innovation. Are VCs set up to deliver that return on innovation? Is the structure set up in order to return? Turn. I think so. At, at least I think it's, it's in, in our case, an ambition. That's why we not only work with our prop tech uh, uh, companies, but also work with our LPs in order to um, help them transforming their business. So working with the digital uh, responsible guys, uh, how to connect the prop techs to... Uh, that's also the idea of Blackprint Booster, basically. I know, connect I know, the I know. industry <laughs> with, with the prop techs, and we continue to that, do that along the VC um, journey. That's why I specifically raised that question, because when you refer to what we do on a, on a regular basis, we create this community around it, and we know that it costs money that is, goes beyond the fund management fee that you would expect. It's That's why I raised the question, is it part of the, of the VC DNA and part of the VC financing structure to enable yeah, education on the LP side? I don't think so. Just, you know, I think it's not a part of a classic... VC DNA. We're not kind of trained to to educate and and train our LPs. I think it has to be very clear that the financial return is the core, and everything else is an add-on. And I think if you structure it like that, then it then everything works pretty nicely because then you have. And again, I'm coming back to what you said: expectation management. You can do workshops. You can help them, and of course. And I think this is something where we hear all of us um, kind of put add on a table as an, as an uh, value add is the access to the market through the LP side. But um, I think it's, it, it has to be clearly viewed as an add on and not as a core. So you talk about access to the market. So you pull in your LPs actively to support growth for your portfolio companies? Um, yes. And also through. Um, them, we actually, like in the last four years, started building our own network um, within the industry, having kind of the trust, the trust from the industry because of uh, our LP. I think this is how it works because then again, it's your relationship and you have to find people who are incentivized to then help your portfolio companies because I think I've never seen um, that it really works in 100% of the times this... Um, this promise that if I have this three LPs and they are all corporates, and then tomorrow you're going to have you, dear portfolio company, you're going to have a deal with all of them, never worked and will never work. Um, but of course, through them, together with them, it's again, it's you have to invest your time to build your own network. And Arne, is this one of your USPs that you can reach out to your LPs and make connections to the real real estate world? It is certainly part of it. I think um, we, our LP network is a mixture of corporates and uh, large institutional capital, which has real estate exposure. What I've noticed with those groups, and I'll come on to the longer answer in a second, with those groups is over the last few years, as we've been speaking to them, they've been appointing individuals who, who actually carry weight within their firms, whether it's their former CIO, who's now wearing a digital hat, or empowering their middle management to start looking at technology and trying to figure out how do they put it into their institutional real estate portfolios. So I think the LPs certainly within our, in our group um, now have an active mandate to try and adopt new practices, new, new business models, because they're seeing some of the challenges um, from a resi perspective or from a commercial perspective, and more recently retail as well. So there is a systemic change from their viewpoint. And then our partnership with them is very much driven by financial returns because that's how we're incentivized. But they also want to be taking as much information from us because their personal PL or bonuses are attached to actually adopting technology at the much more institutional level. Uh, yet to see how effective that change in mentality is in terms of adopting technology that we're investing in. But certainly is the right step forward that everyone along that value chain, all the way from the decision maker putting capital into our fund he's then, or this individual is then giving the mandate to people within his team to actually go out and actually utilize his technology. 
but coming back to kind of Darren's first point, fundamentally, we're there to return financial uh, returns to these LPs. And then the beneficial secondary for them should be operational upside. Um, so that's kind of how we're driven. So this, this session is also about you. So if you have questions, I already see one, which I'm going to pick up in a second. But if you have more questions, ping them over, and we're going to incorporate this into the discussion. Um, um, uh, in terms of um, your expectations for the business models, we've talked a lot about scaling. We saw it, we heard it in the last session. What, what is your starting point? What is scaling? And is there a scaling test that the entrepreneurs can go through so they understand that they are ready to talk to you? I think scaling means that you can basically accelerate and increase with ever so more limited resources in general. And I think it's more a mindset and an execution capability than a, something which you start with at the startup. Usually you start with an idea, product, approach. Or, and I think the, the need to scale is something which you start to look at after, let's say, two years, once you have a product market fit. And then you start to scale your sales, your tech, your whatever you need to scale. So I think it's, it's a necessary skill along the journey, which you, I think, should not start with, but have as an ambition in your mind when you're a founder. Mark's response didn't, didn't uh, um, refer to asset heavy or asset light business models. Daria, what's your take? I think, to add, like, this is correct to add to you, I think if you're a startup and you you want to have you a agree with me? I always agree with you. <laughs> no. um, you don't need to agree. That's the point of this. <laughs> no, but I am, I'm adding. Because this is... Um, Mark told you the perspective from the founder's uh, view, point of view. And if you are a venture capitalist, the scalability also means the speed, how fast the startup can grow. Because usually we have this lifetime of a fund and we have to return our... Um, the money triple, for quadruple to our investors within this time. So if you want to have a VC on your cap table and a part of your journey, you have to know that you will have to scale very, very fast. That means grow very fast at limited resources so we can fulfill our promise to our investors. And I think this is something many startups forget or right now i think in the last five years again everyone wants to have a venture capital financing and then it's so cool to have a vcs on board sometimes it's not and sometimes your business model is just not it's a perfect business idea perfect product you have the need you have you can solve it but then it's actually not a vc case and the vc case would be if you're ready and willing and your product and your market allow you that and your technology to fast to grow exponentially fast and we need it because we have our business model and i think we have to educate not only our LPs but also startups about what is the business model behind the vc so many save a lot of time and blood and so <laughs> Ani, do you agree that you need to educate uh, PropTech entrepreneurs on, on your business model? And do you turn um, promising companies down because, as uh, Daria said, maybe the uh, uh, growth story does not seem to be as fast as your business model? I think, broadly speaking, most entrepreneurs now know, understand the VC model. I think there's plenty of material out there. I think every other day there are uh, the posts in various um, tech media organizations telling us how the model works, et cetera. But I think there's always a disconnect between what they know the VC model is and how they then think about their own business model, right? There's founder bias because every, business, every founder believes their business is super scalable, is solving a real problem, and they've identified that, you know, that secret source to make it grow pretty quickly. And so a lot of the companies that we see, because well, obviously we're not at seed, so we have, the mic sorry, we're not at a seed stage, we tend to be series A, series B, we're kind of focused on distribution channels, who you're selling to, who within organizations are making the decisions that will impact, uh, impact you, your ability to actually sell and kind of move on and use the network. So one of the challenges we find is we often see great products, great innovative uh, models in the market that make sense. But then we get to a point with the founders, with their kind of traction to date, and actually suddenly find a challenge of actually who is buying this uh, service, who is going to adopt this technology within an organization, who is the decision maker, who do you need to go to impress, 
Um, because as VCs, we've got, we're limited on time. So we're not going to sit there and spend two, three weeks figuring out who they're going to sell their product to. The founders themselves need to convince us they've identified roughly who it is at least. Even better, they've identified who it is and they just need access to that person and understand exactly what they're thinking and what they need to tell this individual in order to get them over the line. Um, and often that's where we find founders quite falling at that hurdle. Um, but uh, as Dari said, there's plenty of opportunities in the market which are adding value, are interesting businesses. But until you can find a channel through which you can sell, you've identified who within organizations, within a general set of organizations, are going to buy your products, that's when it starts getting really interesting from a scale up VC capital perspective. Uh, up until then, angels, I'm sure, will help you on that journey and will spend that extra bit of time to figure those questions out. Um, so that's kind of where we sit. When I look actually back, or um, kind of personal experience, is that it's not so much about the business model and the product. It's mostly, in my view, about the personal aspiration of the founder. Uh, the as ambition to do really think big. That's why often American or Israeli founders are more brave, at least in being outspoken about it and about the personality to really create something big. Um, if you have that drive, then you are more likely to overcome the nitty-gritty issues which are in your business model. That uh, directs a little bit like, uh, to the over-self-confident uh, founder that ha has a two-digit million valuation before he has his MVP ready. Is, is that what you experienced, Daria? Um. How how do you rate the personality of the founder? Well, it's, we do a lot of reference calls. And so for your product, and also I said it before, we love reference calls. Um, and that's of course your personal experience. And we like bold and a little bit you know, cocky uh, guys and girls who can sell. And there is this very slim line between you know, being arrogant and overselling and being ambitious, passionate, and, and in love with your product and knowing what you do. Um, but we do a lot of ref calls, so we, we, we want to hear, you know, to learn more from, from real data and real people you worked with and, and see how that goes. Cool, thank you. Now we have a couple of questions and uh, ideally we cover all of them and have really short answers, like one sentence answers. Last deal you did and why you said yes. Mark, bottom question. The last deal was a company called BIMSpot in Vienna. Um, that's an innovative way of combining different uh, um, perspectives uh, in the construction process, uh, planner, architect, etc., um, and supporting BIM, BIM technology. And why? Because the two founders were ambitious and had a very different attitude towards entering the market more as a freemium model, not so much as a pilot project mindset, and that is what convinced us. Oh, yeah. Um, the last startup we invested is Choose. Choose is an Oslo-based um, climate action platform, so we also... Choose as in the stuff that we drink? No, Choose <laughs> is like cho cho choose your action, and then with three O's. Um, so choose.today, check it out. <laughs> it's actually a B2B, B2C platform for climate action, so we also invest in energy tech, and it's a little bit on, like, at the edge of our investment focus, and we invested uh, in them because it's, it's a super senior, super excited and motivated team. They have great traction, they have a product which is not only um, kind of making financial uh, sense uh, financially and also solving a big problem, but it's, it's a very... It's a I very love it. It's a long f one sentence. Oh, yeah, I had the one <laughs> sentence. Okay, yeah. They sell, so, yeah, saving the world. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Arnie. Spacemaker was the deal we did. Uh, principle behind the business is they uh, essentially run multiple algorithms to optimize your floor plates when you're creating uh, or about to build new buildings. They work with four of the largest house builders in the Nordics. Over the last, uh, over the 12 months of testing their product, they've consistently created 10% more livable space. So if you're a house builder and someone says they can give you 10% more livable space for the same spend, that's 10% pure margin on top of your business. Um, so 
very clear proposition, uh, value proposition to the end user. And then we looked at the technology that they built, spent 12 months with 25 plus data scientists building that platform out. So really strong technology, founders want to take over the world. And the first three clients are the biggest three clients in their market, and they're all willing to pay significant, uh, significant amounts of money to use their service. Cool, thank you. We have one minute or two minutes left, and I have so many questions. So I focus on one, and then I have a final question to, to you guys. In the coming 12 months, uh, more funds are going to come up. So the question is, if the, if the competition among, each, uh, among the VCs is increasing, and we've seen prop tech dedicated funds, f funds emerge, we have seen uh, corporate VCs uh, come up, how do you differentiate? in a, hopefully a small... Uh, for us, answer. I think it's quite clear. We uh, provide deep sector expertise, uh, not, our, not only with our LPs, but also with our people. Um, we have been entrepreneurs building companies, and we work with the founders to scale their companies in a very intense way. Some have, have spoken about it uh, today, so that's our USP. Dahlia. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably going to say the same thing these two guys are going to say. Um, the pitch of a VC is a very boring, similar thing. So we also have, we have been in the market for, since 2015, invested and in, seen a lot on this market, worked with many companies. Um, we have the market access and understanding and kind of build an ecosystem around us and also within our portfolio. But I think in the end of the day, it's also about people and I think we're a nice team and um, the feedback from my portfolio is they like work with us. <laughs> <laughs> Arnie. Um, yeah, probably s s a lot of similar yeah, things there. But, uh, you, you only need to say what is new, maybe. Yeah, no, so from our perspective, look, we, are, we have a direct partnership with a real estate investment firm called Randall Capital, it's got circa 10 billion euros. So we have direct access to their team and their assets. Secondary, we have direct access to, indirect access to multiple LPs who have almost half a trillion in real estate AUM and operations. So we have the ability to help these companies scale across Europe. And our fund strategy is probably slightly different. We, we have a pan-European focus. We're looking to invest kind of series A, series B, series C. So actually would like to work with the guys to my left um, as a much more kind of regional and going in slightly earlier stage. And I think that's, where, that's the gap we're sitting at. Great. So, as a final remark, uh, I have a question for every one of you with um, yeah, the desire to have a short, precise um, statement or impulse into the, into the um, audience. So, Arnie, I start with you. What's your, what's, what is your message to the fellow investors out there? You just addressed the two of them, but there's other investors in the room. What is your message? What should they do? What would you wish? Now it's the time. The media is here to send a strong statement. In terms of co-investors or? What, whatever comes to your mind, what co-investors should deliver us to make PropTech great, to make the ecosystem great, what do you think, what is on your mind that should improve or what you, th what you want to convey as a message? I mean, repeatedly today we've talked about scaling and the industry not being able to adopt the technology quick enough. So if we have co-investors coming into rounds, beyond just capital, it would be fantastic to have co-investors who can actually give these companies access and help change the way the real estate industry operates. Mark, what's your message to the founders? You've seen a lot of them, you've coached a lot of them. Um, from your experience, what can these young entrepreneurs take from that day? Be ambitious, as, as I said. Uh, be open and fast to learn and be ready also for the tough times. And there's a good book, The Hard Things About the Hard Things, and there's much truth in it. <laughs> Daria, final question go goes to you, and it's addressed to the corporates, who are also present. What's your message to the corporates? Be m more open-minded and risk-taking, and allow the startups we talk really like we talk about uh, out there to really work with you sustainably and don't make the digital and innovation just a part of your marketing strategy but be a part make it a part of your dna thank you very much it was a pleasure to have you on stage thank you very much for listening in this was the VC panel. Apologies that we could not cover all the, uh, the questions, but this is what this conference is also about. If they can, can not answer the questions on stage, you can grab them off stage, you will be around. And uh, latest at the Currywurst and the beer, you'll have a chance um, to all further pick their brains. So the track here closes now. 
Um, you can still hang out here or join us in the, uh, in the other room for the final um, keynotes and then later on for the networking session. So thanks again. Thanks to Daria, Ani and Mark and your applause.